bringing the people behind our food to life. So this is what my book project has attempted to document in both words and pictures. Not, not uh, with my essays or photos, but with uh, 30 of the country's many writers and farmers and chefs and medical researchers with images from over 70 different photographic resources. The harsh reality for all of us is that the CAFO production model is by its own accord bumping up against some very serious limitations. The real cost of these production systems, often cleverly hidden from public view, are mounting. And they will be paid by all of us. Let's talk about a few. Production diseases. Certainly all production operations have risks, small or large, organic or conventional, national or international. But with the heavy concentration of nearly genetically identical animals housed in these operations, when a disease appears inside a CAFO, it can sweep through an animal population and go out in the food system in a hurry. This past August recall of 500 million eggs from salmonella co contamination points to one of the serious drawbacks of mega-scale animal confinement systems. Those half billion eggs originated from just two CAFO operators in Iowa. The loss of farm communities, which Kendra talked to earlier. The rise of CAFOs over the last 50 years has coincided with the loss of millions of family farmers. Coincided is the operative term here because it has been anything but a coincidence as regulations have been written and rewritten, subsidy programs established, conglomerates that dominate all sectors of the market created, and the food system corporatized, as Nicolette Hahn Nyman says, from piglet to pork chop. While the CAFO operators have flooded the market with so-called cheap meat, dairy, poultry, and eggs, the profit margins for the average livestock producer has nearly vanished. At a recent USDA and Department of Justice hearing this summer, West Virginia poultry grower Mike Weaver testified that a large bucket of fried chicken in his area of the country fetches $26.95. The contract grower who raised the chicken for that bucket will earn just 30 cents. Six months of raising a hog can bring a grower less than $10 per animal. There's no way that this system supports the small independent producer that we used to see as the face of American agriculture. Farmers either get big, find a niche market, or beg for subsidies and price supports from the federal government. More often not than not, they disappear altogether. In 1950, there were 6 million family farmers in America. By the turn of this century, 300,000 operators are responsible for producing 90% of all farm output. One third of those operators is over 55 years of age. It's a prudent question to ask, who is going to grow our food? Antibiotic overdose. How do you keep 2,000 hogs in a single barn or 80,000 chickens in a factory hen house, or 100,000 cows on a beef feedlot. Normally, with a life support system of small doses of antibiotic medicines and chemically fluffed up industrial diet. According to researchers at the Johns Hopkins Medical School who wrote an important essay for CAFO, antibiotics have been heralded as the great medical discovery of the past 500 years. Their value for medi the medical commons, the medicines that we humans depend on, upon to fight outbreaks and epidemics, are being squandered inside CAFOs. More antibiotics are used for animal food production in the state of North Carolina than in all of human medicine. And more antibiotics are used in the state of Iowa for animal food production than all of human medicine. What we see are the rise and risk of antibiotic-resistant diseases linked to animal factory production, salmonella, E. coli, MS, MRSA, and others, that we may be powerless to combat with the antibiotic medicines when the time arises. Fecal flood. If you call around, as I do, to the many citizen activist groups around the country against whom the battle for the CAFO industry is being waged on a daily basis, you hear a lot of horror stories. Stench so foul, residents can't go outside or plan family picnics or even visit loved ones in cemeteries. 
Manure running through field ditches straight out into public waterways. Fish kills due to fecal flooding. 100,000, a quarter million, a million fish killed when floods overwhelm manure storage lagoons and already saturated farm fields and water tables. Many CAFOs are concentrated in areas prone to heavy rainfall and even the regular paths of hurricanes. Ethical collapse. I'd like to bring up one final matter about the untold costs of CAFOs. I will simply quote one of the authors of the book, Matthew Scully. Factory farming isn't just killing. It is a negation, a complete denial of the animal as a living being with his or her own needs and nature. It is not the worst evil that we can do, but it is the worst evil we can do to them. It confronts us with the animal equivalent of Abraham Lincoln's condemnation of human slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Matthew Scully is not an activist working for the Riverkeeper or Sierra Club or Farm Sanctuary or the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, but a former speechwriter for President George W. Bush and candidates John McCain and Sarah Palin. And as he writes in his excellent book, Dominion, the ethics of animal raising and slaughter is not the territory of the right or left, of conservative or liberal, but the issue of right or wrong, of human decency or inhumanity. I truly believe if you take some time to look to consider the measure words of the many authors and essays in this book, to look at some of the many hundreds of photographs inside, we will all come to the con same conclusion. We can definitely do better than this. Making healthy foods more affordable and accessible to all citizens must become local, state, and national priorities. Americans already eat more animal protein than the USDA dietaries recommend, an average of 5.5 ounces of protein from meat, fish, beans, and nuts combined daily. Meanwhile, two-thirds of Americans are classified as either overweight or obese, with most of their saturated fats traced back to grain-fed animal foods. There have to be better ways, even if we have to pay a bit more up front for our food, even if we have to alter our eating habits, even if we have to make the choice, as 11-year-old Burke Bear recently described at the TEDx Next Generation Conference in Asheville, North Carolina, you can pay the farmer or you can pay the hospital. The cost of preventable nutritional diseases has already reached $150 billion per year and is still climbing, so I think the 11-year-old homeschooled kid has a point. It's time to put the CAFO out to pasture, to put our animals out on pastures where deep-rooted perennial plants protect the soil, filter water, store carbon, where animals can grow more slowly and develop fats and proteins that are beneficial to our diets and where a lot more farmers are involved in their care. The question becomes, if not an industrial animal food production system, then what kind? If not meat, eggs, and poultry from some faraway processing plant, then from where, and under what conditions, and at what cost, and in what quantities? What would the alternatives look like, and how can we possibly scale them up? What are some of the challenges in creating a pasture-based food system that supports much, if not all, of your local community over the next 20 to 30 years? And as hard as it may seem, or as simplistic as it may sound, I believe the real work of the next 10 years will be finding more ways to help people know your farmer, know your food, grow your own, and spread the health and wealth. And if that is just way too basic, I would say, we can go for strict legislation on antibiotic use in, in uh, confinement animal operations, reforms, farm bill reforms, subsidy reforms that actually incentivize the healthy production of food rather than what we've got right now, reform of the competition title, which right now has, has allowed corporations to really dominate the system a rise in fuel, in fuel prices, which will inevitably shrink the, uh, the miles that food can travel and the amount of fuel we can actually pump directly into the food system. And finally, 
the rebuilding of local food systems, which I know is why you're all here tonight. Thank you very much.